Hello, this is Kim Doherty, career consultant for the San Jose State University iSchool. I'd like to welcome you to today's career podcast where we'll be interviewing Scott Brown, whose official title is Senior Cybrarian for Oracle. He's also of the, the owner of his own business, Social Information Group. He's a published author of a book called Social Information. And you may also know Scott in his role as adjunct faculty for the San Jose iSchool program. I've been fortunate to know Scott for many years, and during that time, I have learned just a ton of information and and good ideas and innovative thinking from him. So because of that, I'm really happy to have Scott with us so you can also benefit from his professional experience and insights. And I'm guessing that Scott is blushing right now. Um, <laughs> if you know Scott, you know that this is all true. So with that, I'd like to say welcome, Scott. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to be here. And yes, um, I'm choked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the benefits for, for me working with San Jose State students is that I get to hear from them about a faculty member and at faculty members and adjunct faculty members that they've worked with and learned from. And I know that you are an important contributor to the program. So that's one of the things that makes it so special for us to have you with us today. So I'm going to ask Scott some questions and, and have him give us his background, his perspective, his insights, because he's had a very unusual career and can contribute on a lot of different levels. So with that, my first question to Scott is, Cybrarian is one of those great titles that can be infinitely adaptable depending on the organization's needs. But I think it's also a great term to describe how adaptable your particular career has been since you graduated with your MLIS from the San Jose State University program. So could you tell us a bit about your career journey? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was actually surprised to find that Cybrarian is my official HR system title. It's, it's actually, you know, it's not something I made up. It's a title that they actually gave to me, which I guess was forward thinking on their part. But um, so, uh, you know, I went to San Jose State before it was an online program. I started it back in 1996, I think it was. But um, over the time that I've been a librarian, I've worked in public settings, I've worked in academic settings, and I've worked in, in corporate settings. Um, so I started as a page, I did circulation desk clerk, I did interlibrary loans. Um, in a public setting, um, I went to an academic setting for a small community college, um, did reserve collections and they actually upgraded and automated their system while I was there, which was fascinating because I'm kind of more on the tech side and I love that that kind of stuff. But that's actually part of what got me to San Jose State is uh, I thought in my head at the time that I would become a systems librarian um, because I thought it was just really cool to see how it all worked and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, I got my degree and I did a practicum at Sun Microsystems, if you recognize that name from the, I guess the first dot-com boom uh, <laughs> back in 2000. Uh, and um, I got that actually based on taking an HTML class at San Jose State. Um, they hired me to, to do, or not hired me, but I did my practicum to help them update some of their sites. And uh, what happened is um, they had a temporary opening come open for a researcher, which is not something I had planned for at all. I had taken one reference class, the reference class available through San Jose State, at least at the time. And, uh, but I said, sure, <laughs> sure, I can do that. Um, and I have been doing research essentially ever, ever since. Um, I was with Sun for about nine years and then um, left to do uh, independent work while I was actually getting a second master's degree in community counseling and uh, was focusing on social media. I was writing, that's actually when I wrote, wrote the book that you mentioned, um, doing presenting. Uh, for a while I was doing content development for a, 
uh, publication or a firm called FreePint, which is now called Ginfo, which is based in the UK. Um, as you mentioned, also adjunct faculty, both at Den University of Denver's program and San Jose State. Um, and then joined Qualcomm for a little bit. They are a, a chip uh, company, mobile chip company based in San Diego. Was there for almost two years and that was wonderful weather-wise. Um, and then have been with Oracle since October 2014. And, and for Oracle, you have, that's a remote position, correct? That's correct. I am based in Portland, Oregon right now. And how do you like working remotely? Um, you know, I've worked remotely when I was at Sun Microsystems, and but I was in an office at Qualcomm. And so I was used to working remotely, um, you know, both kind of the discipline of it and um, how the flow kind of changes and kind of being away from people. Um, and so going back into an office was a bit of an adjustment. I thought coming back would be fairly easy, but I actually, I missed some of the interaction that you get um, when you're actually in an office or, or in a building. But again, I've, I've readjusted as well. Okay. So now let's talk about what being a Cybrarian entails for Oracle. Could you tell us a bit about your specific responsibilities and maybe what a typical day or week or month might look like for you? Yeah, so the information function is a very small function. Uh, the, what we call virtual information services consists essentially of three people for I think we're 143,000 people globally. So um, we do, so there's two big chunks to what I do. One is what I kind of think broadly of as content management. So there are um, technical resources like IEEE Digital Library, ACM Digital Library, um, market and business resources like Harvard Management or EBSCO, um, and then some soft skills resources, um, again, like Harvard Management or lynda.com, that we essentially negotiate and deploy and make available to the entire company. So everyone at Oracle has access to those, and that's a big part of what we do is procuring those things, making sure we understand what's available, making sure people understand what's, what's out there, driving that usage and essentially integrating it wherever it, it makes sense. Um, the other big bucket of what I do is uh, what I think of as research and content curation. So uh, on-demand research, and we're typically working with um, folks who are at senior director, director, VP level within the company um, when they're doing their planning, anything that's business related that they need information support on, we're open to that. Um, and then the, on the content curation side, what we do is we have a couple of internal blogs and other places that we push out information um, around what's going on in the industry, for example, or the various um, uh, industry verticals that the company focuses on, or um, you know, curating content, for example, around artificial intelligence or um, machine learning or uh, autonomous driving or whatever that might be. So. Um, a lot of content management and also navigating that content in order to get the business the answers that it needs. So typical day, um, <laughs> I'm sure you get this a lot. There's no typical day. But, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I realized that was a trick question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the on-demand research really drives the day. So if I have something that's come in, um, you know, I'll negotiate a deadline around that. Sometimes it needs to be turned around quickly. Sometimes there's more lead time, but those typically always take priority. So it might be a heavy research day. It might be a, a lighter research day. Um, the other thing that I'm typically doing is I'm curating content for a newsletter that goes out to all uh, the human resources uh, team across the globe, over 2,000 people, um, trying to get content to keep them up to speed as far as what's going on kind of in the HR human capital space. Um, and that's, again, more on the content curation side. Um, typically, I'm meeting with people. For some reason on my schedule these days, I've got a lot of 6 a.m. calls because oh. I'm talking with folks over in the UK or in, in Europe. Um, it's better than India calls, at least for me, which are, you know, 11 o'clock. 12 o'clock at night, so I'm a morning person. But my, my day starts pretty early, primarily by choice. But, um, uh, you know, and I also wrap up typically around 4 p.m. or so, so. Okay, and what skills would you say are most in demand in 
in your role or a role that would be similar to yours? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so our group, just to kind of give you an idea of the structure, and this will make sense in a, in a moment, is we actually report up through an HR communications group which reports up through essentially HR and learning and development. And um, so we report up to a group that's communicating essentially all over the world um, in the company. And so a lot of what we're doing, which ties in very well with what we're trying to do, is having those strong communication skills. So written, um, you know, being able to present, doing all of those kinds of things. And to me, the interesting thing about that is I think it's really reflective of um, the job survey that San Jose State does every year, looking at those on-demand, you know, most in-demand skills um, that are out there and communication and collaboration are always at the top of the list. And I think that's absolutely true for this, this role as well. I definitely live that every day. Um, what I find as far as the research piece um, in getting under, having a good understanding of what information is going to be useful for my clients is a really, really strong set, I'm not bragging, but strong set of listening skills and really understanding uh, what the customer or the client needs are. Um, so that's, that's a big, big piece of what I do. Um, I'll talk, probably talk a little bit more about this later, but constantly learning. I mean, doing research is essentially constantly learning. Um, and within a, a corporate organization, I think a lot of, you know, especially for-profit organizations, a lot of organizations are just very fast moving. And so there's a need for a lot of adaptability and the ability to do a lot of different roles and a lot of different as, uh, tasks. And so, you know, and the ability to kind of reprioritize sometimes several times a day, depending mm -hmm. on what's coming in, you know, and what's, and what's going on in the organization. That, <clears throat> excuse me, that sounds very familiar um, to, to work that I've done in the past. And I think it's that adaptability that is what um, sort of keeps opening up opportunities. So sort of along those lines, what courses did you take or what skills did you learn in grad school? And I realized this was a way back um, that you found <laughs> most important to your ability to move into new roles and opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I already illustrated a little bit that I took a lot of technical classes, and then what actually what I ended up going into was research, <laughs> um, which you know, okay. So that's that's one one thing. But um, you know, for me. Um, Again, I, I guess I emphasize the communication piece. My undergraduate is a writing degree. Um, and so I actually did, did writing and I did that solely for, for pleasure. And what I found is that um, that actually has come in quite handy throughout my career. Um, but one of the skills not necessarily related to the actual course content was this ability to switch modes quickly. So, you know, for example, as a student, you might be taking um, a database class, and then you might also have a management class, and you might have, you know, some other class that is fairly unrelated. And be, the ability to switch between those modes effectively and kind of juggle all those as you go along is a skill that I never really thought about that I think I gained in grad school. Um, you know, what, the big thing that got me, I think, as I mentioned in my practicum, and I think has held me in good stead in the industry that I'm in, which is the tech industry, is that kind of technical savviness. And I am not a programmer, I am not a coder by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. But being curious about it and being willing to kind of uh, learn at least the language and the landscape of whatever you're dealing with will take you quite far. And again, I mentioned, you know, the, the single class that probably got me into my practicum was that HTML class. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, I've been fortunate enough to be able to take advantage of a lot of other learning opportunities, you know, technical, technical and otherwise, so. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense because what you're sort of talking about um, in terms of what you learned in grad school was a process of how you approach 
different kinds of challenges and different kinds of learning um, situations. And sort of to your point, that's going to go on over and over again. But if you are willing to embrace that and jump in and say, I don't know this yet, or this is what I need to learn to become not at a point of mastery, but at a point of understanding that that's huge, I would think. And, and your point about students doing this on an ongoing basis throughout their grad school program without really understanding what a skill that is to be able to switch gears like that. That's, that's a really good point and, and I would encourage students to recognize that in themselves as well. Okay, that, that was wonderful, thank you. How about what other skills you've had to learn since grad school? So, you know, now we're looking at decades here to adapt <laughs> to the changing or unanticipated requirements of your role. So basically, how have you learned to become more adaptable and what have you learned, had to learn through that process? And I'm gonna guess number one it was probably how to do research. Yes, yes. And, you know, uh, in on the research side, I've been very fortunate to have some very good mentors. Um, you know, my first first research manager at Sun Microsystems was, she actually came from a journalism background, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and so she was very good at what she did and very patient with me, which was good, um, but really kind of walking me through it and allowing me the time and the space to kind of get familiar with, with the resources, with the techniques really, um, and with just the, the landscape of technology, which again, coming into it, I just, I had no idea really. Um, I knew it was exciting, but I didn't know much, <laughs> much more beyond that. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of different thoughts that I could share around this, but um, from the content side, um, one of the things that I really enjoy about my work is I learn something new every day, literally. Um, you know, part of my job, which is to, to me a, a blessing and, and a wonderful thing, is that I need to keep track of a lot of information. And so, though it is a lot of information, again, I'm constantly learning. And so, so having, building over time, over a long time, <laughs> the discipline to, to kind of curate my own information feed, um, to, to be specific to what I need to know and to not be overwhelming is an ongoing learn for me, an ongoing task. Um, on the skills side, um, what I've found more often, number one, there's a huge amount of on-demand and oftentimes free resources and ways to learn out there. Whether you want to learn video creation, which is something that I have learned and picked up um, since graduation, um, it's been a blast and there's a lot of different ways that you can learn about that. Um, visually, you know, whatever, whatever learning mode that you, that you use. Um, some of the ways that I've kind of honed some of this is recently I've, uh, I've taken some Linda courses, you know, online video courses around writing headlines and around mm -hmm. storytelling, um, which actually, again, kind of continuing to hone those communication skills, but understanding the persuasiveness and the effectiveness that you can really give to whether you're doing research or you know whatever your whatever kind of information you're sharing um, to really drive the impact of of what you're trying to share, um, and then you know another piece um, that has been a learned process is and again over <laughs> over years has been really being able to put yourself in the shoes of your client, your customer, your patron, whoever that is. Um, it is a learned thing. It is a skill um, and it takes time, but the more effectively that you can do that um, and understand, you know, what if I were getting what I'm giving this person and being able to evaluate it from their perspective is incredibly value, valuable in driving how you can make more valuable deliverables. I know hmm. I'm starting to talk in phrases, but <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. I think it does. So, so basically what you're saying is someone has asked me for information. I have found that information. I'm going to give that, them that information. But is the way in which I am presenting that information 
the way that's most easily absorbed by them. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And yeah, yeah, there are people, you know, they want the answer. They want the <laughs> figure, you know, they want whatever it is, which is fine. There are other people, and I've explicitly asked people about this, you know, what do you prefer, um, who they want the broad spectrum. They're like, give me everything. I want it all because that's how I process information. Not everybody knows themselves that well, but um, having that, that's kind of a gift in a way that the requester is giving you. So. Cool. Okay. Um, as part of what you're doing or, or when you're presenting information, are you being asked to do data visualization? Um, typically not, but I like to be able to do it when I can. <laughs> so it's something that I've certainly dabbled in. And depending upon what it is, oftentimes if I'm working with figures, um, I will, you know, do some basic, there are some very basic tools that you can use even just in Excel to highlight the information to make differences and variations stand out more. And so oftentimes, if appropriate, I'll, I'll do that. Visualiz visualization is an interesting field because it looks great, but it is incredibly difficult to do elegantly and in a way that is meaningful without it just being a bunch of colors or <laughs> pretty designs. And so um, it's, it's used judiciously um, and looking for those opportunities to apply it. Um, when you get that opportunity, it can make a huge difference. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, so are there any changes on the horizon that you feel will have a strong impact on the work and or opportunities of information professionals? So basically, our students. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I have had this conversation is, you know, back when I graduated, that sounds so funny. Uh, <laughs> so when we all, you know, we didn't have electricity back then. Right. Um, no, but back when I graduated, I felt so optimistic about the opportunities because in my perspective, information was everywhere. That was kind of the first phase of knowledge management when people were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on knowledge management systems um, and then they realized that, that what, they didn't really work that well. Um, <laughs> but there was just, it seemed to me like there was information everywhere. And I think through all of my experience and all of my roles, that's only become more apparent. And so there is going to constantly be this need, I think, for people to help people make sense out of information. And I think that's one of, at least coming from a research side, but also from a taxonomy side, from a records management side, being able to put some kind of framework or make some kind of sense out of something is only be going to become more important. Um, but I also think we have this parallel challenge of continuing to have to define and redefine our niche and what we can do. Um, it's fascinating to me because I regularly, not often, but regularly get clients asking me, you know, you've done this, can you do this? <laughs> you know, is this and is this okay to ask you to do? And my answer almost always is yes, of course, I'd love to do that. And so I think you know, continually demonstrating our value um, is going to be a constant. Um, and I think we also have the opportunity to, you know, do more and better, but also to expand out, to build your skills portfolio as you go along. And my experience has been, at least, is that, at least when I look back, that all the skills that I've gained over all the various roles that I've taken have lent have, have become valuable in some way. And so uh, the more that you can do that kind of skills building for yourself, I think the better. I don't know if I answered your question exactly, but. <laughs> um, I think that you did. And it, it relates back to, um, and you had mentioned that we've talked about this re before, and, and I will relate one of my Scott Brown stories, which is when Scott and I one time we're talking about sort of how we were looking at our careers and our, our, I think it was the coming year, Scott's comment to me was his mantra for the year was going to be to say yes. And when you look at your career like that, for example, if someone says to you, can you do this? Is it okay to ask you to do this? If you're answer is pretty much always yes, 
that puts you in the position that Scott's talking about of constantly growing into new opportunities. And they may be opportunities that aren't obvious when you first start your job, but as you d demonstrate your value, then more and more people will gravitate to you as a possible solution to the challenge that they're facing. So I, I'm seconding exactly what Scott has said there. We can't tell what the new opportunities will be for tomorrow. We just know that they're going to be there. And, and so sort of our goal is, okay, have a mindset of, Yes, there is a, a phrase that HR managers use frequently, which is hire for attitude and um, train for skills. Well, if you think about that in terms of your career, your own career, if your attitude is say yes, which I would attribute to Scott, um, I think that you will find you have wonderful, wonderful opportunities to contribute. So. Next question for you, Scott, um, and this is an easy one. What, prof <laughs> what professional organizations and or social media groups do you belong to or would you recommend for people who are doing the kind of work that you do? Yeah, it's a good question. So for me, um, I'm, I'm a longtime member of SLA, Special Libraries Association, um, and SLA helped build my career in way, in many different ways. Um, through the relationships, through the volunteer work that I've done with SLA, um, you know, it, working with vendors, talking with vendors, it's just, it really has been a, a, a <laughs> it's, it's been a phenomenal organization for me. Um, you know, I've been a member, just due to kind of my focus areas, I've been a member of SKIP, which is the they've changed their name and I'm still <laughs> learning the, the new strategic and competitive intelligence professional. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not currently a member. Maybe that's why I don't, don't remember it, but it, very valuable for the, um, for the learning around those particular areas. Um, and a, they've got a, actually a really strong mentoring, um, I think group in there as well. Um, those are two key ones that come to mind on the social media side. I'm trying to think, you know, I, there was a, a while, a time where I flirted with, um, uh, oh, and I'm going to forget the name. Silip, C-I-L-I-P. Ah, right. The UK um, based uh, or maybe European uh, uh, information professionals group and I thought they're I think they're doing really strong work as well it's been a while since I've connected with them but um, I've always I've always been impressed with their work so that was harder than I thought it was gonna be <laughs> <laughs> and and I would um, second your comment about Silip they are UK based and they do a tremendous amount of knowledge creation they they look at the profession, they look at what's going on in the profession, public libraries are struggling for funding in the UK, um, but as an organization, they are incredibly supportive of all of the libraries. It, it's not like they have SLA and PLA and ALA, SILIP, which is C as in Charlie, I-L-I-P, um, embraces all of the different types of li libraries and librarians, and they're a very strong group to follow. Okay, so over the course of your career, oh, this is going to be tough, what work have you enjoyed the most or found the most rewarding? <laughs> um, well, there's, uh, I guess there's two, two answers to that. One is if, if you're a researcher, or just like researching topics, there's that zone that you get into when you're researching and really kind of deep into it and discovering the topic and finding really cool stuff. Um, that's one of my favorite experiences. Again, that, that kind of experience of constantly learning. Um, I just, there's something that's very meaningful to me about that process. Um, so that's, that's one piece of it. Um, you know, the other thing that I really enjoyed, uh, and your comments are kind of making me reflect on this a little bit, Kim, is being an independent um, 
primarily because it gave me the freedom to, as you were saying, explore a lot of different things and try out a lot of different things and build my skills in many ways that I never would have had the opportunity to do before. So, you know, doing my own marketing for myself and for my services. Um, I started doing a podcast during that time and I learned how to do podcasting. Um, you know, I, I actually doing, while I was doing that, I was uh, contracted to do um, uh, edit, essentially kind of put together a publishing editorial calendar, which was something that I never thought I would do. And, um, and that was a really great experience. The, the challenge with working independently, of course, is income. And <laughs> as, you, as you, part of what you know, Kim, uh, you know, some of the challenges associated with that. Um, but I, I, the freedom to be able to shape um, the work to what almost entirely to what uh, what I wanted to do was was wonderful and again the learning the learning curve was just huge um, which was challenging at the same time but also just very very fulfilling that's I I love that response because I think what happens is for both of us and for many people who do independent work or or really sort of take on any kind of new project is that that challenge is incredibly energizing it, yeah. it's you know you're scared to death but at the same time you've got this wonderful adrenaline rush of i can't wait to jump into this and and learn it and and explore it so very cool. Okay. Yeah. So lastly, what advice would you give students still in grad school in terms of positioning themselves for jobs when they graduate or as they're building their careers? Good question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I have some kind of overall thoughts uh, you know part of what i would love to be able to provide is you know learn x y and z skills <laughs> and i don't i just don't know you know that there's much concrete beyond kind of what i've talked about so far that's too bad because uh, they were really hoping you would say take these three classes and call it good <laughs> right here are the silver bullets yeah, right. I, don't, I don't have that unfortunately <laughs> But um, I will say this, um, and, and kind of share some final thoughts as well, is, um, is think about what you bring to the table that's unique and valuable, um, both in your interests and in your, you know, in the, the coursework that you've done. And actually thinking about that through all of your career previous to where you're going next. Um, so for myself, for example, you know, I think of that video creation piece. Um, it's not something that everybody has. And especially with the proliferation of content being delivered via video these days, it's an interesting and unique skill that I can bring, that I do bring to my environment. I don't do it a lot <laughs> these days because I'm doing so much research. But, um, but being able to do something like that is, again, something that's unique and potentially valuable in different ways that makes you stand out as a candidate. And so, um, so that's kind of probably the most concrete I can get. But, uh, you know, a few other things that I'd suggest is, and I suggest this to pretty much any student that will listen to me, is do informational interviews. Um, so I'll share a story related to my coursework um, at San Jose State is in one of my core courses, the actually it was Cindy Hill, who was the manager of the library at Sun Microsystems, came in and spoke about corporate, her corporate library and what that was like. When I heard that, it was, I thought it was the coolest thing ever, number one. Uh, but the, thing, the other thing she offered is she offered to um, host anybody if you wanted to come visit the library. And I was like, oh my God, of course I'm gonna go do that. And I did. And um, actually, I think I visited more than once. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but she told me, which shocked me, um, that very few people took her up on it. And she did this for many, many classes. And that just floored me because part of me is like, why would you not go <laughs> and check it out? And so I think it's really important to be curious. Um, my experience with anyone in the information professional pretty much universally, um, is that they are more than happy to talk to you about what they do and their experience and to provide 
guidance or suggestions um, that might be helpful to you, no matter what field you're interested in. Um, and no matter what your relationship is, uh, if you're kind of curious and open with them, I think most people are, are very willing to, to help you out. Um, and as Kim said, you know, taking on those tasks or those projects that scare you um, is incredibly valuable. I had a student recently who um, she had graduated and she actually had two different jobs that she was considering. One was kind of in her comfort zone and she, she said, you know, I, I know I can do this well, um, but it doesn't seem that challenging. And she said, this other one, I don't know that I could do it. You know, it kind of scares me. Uh, and I, you know, kind of gave her my perspective, but I said, you know, there's clearly advantages to one or the, or the other of those. And she connected with me and said, um, you know, I ended up taking the other, this other one that, that, that scared me. And I thought, yeah, that's, you know, that's a good choice <laughs> because you really do, you, you know, build your learning curve, you really do learn a lot in a short amount of time. And I think you're oftentimes, I certainly am oftentimes surprised in looking back and saying, yeah, that's, you know, I, did, I accomplished it, number one, and I actually build uh, a lot of skills around that, so. Yep, I, I would agree completely. Um, it, it, and it's one of the wonderful things about the profession is that even if you think, oh my gosh, I don't know this, how am I going to learn it? To your point, people in this profession are so willing to share knowledge and support each other that you learn from each other. Yeah. So it's, that, that is great advice, Scott. Thank, thank you so much. So thank you all for being with us for this interview with Scott Brown, um, who I personally feel is one of the most amazing LIS professionals I know. And Scott, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. I really appreciate it. And I'll look forward to the next time. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>